Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is Max on Maxim Outdoors. Today we're going to be doing something a bit different, and that's trying to catch and cook wild game and wild edibles from this lovely permission that I'm on today. The quarry that we'll be targeting will either be rabbit, squirrels, probably just rabbits and squirrels today. Um, the tool I'll be using today is a pneumatic air rifle in 22 calibre, sub 12 pounds. So here in the UK, we've got a limit on the poundage of air rifles, unless you own an FAC certificate. And this one is currently on 10.9 foot pounds. The reason being is because that's where this gun, in particular gun, shoots most accurately. This is a BSA Scorpion 10 shot, 10 shot magazine, nice Hawk 3x9x50 and super accurate, super quiet rifle. So the plan, I'm trying to get a bit quieter now because I'm going to start my stalk, the plan is just to sneak along these hedgerows throughout the whole of the farm keeping a low profile, taking a couple of steps every 30 seconds or so. Just try to just trying to be quiet and keep your eyes open and use your natural ability to spot spot the animals that you're hunting. The first thing that we want to do before anything is make sure that our rifle is shooting on target and by doing this we've got a lot more confidence that when we do go to take a shot that we're gonna be providing our best effort to take a clean kill on the most humane dispatch of the quarry. So we'll go to the gravel just outside the barn, the gravel area that I use for zero in my rifle, which I know to be 30 yards. We put a little stone, a little stone up on the target representing the size of a rabbit brain. And as long as I know I can hit that cleanly, then I know I'm doing my best to provide a clean kill. So let's go do that now. <sighs> Probably a risky move putting it so close to the camera but oh well, it's all content. There is my rabbit brain sized stone. So I think you'll agree that uh, my rifle is dead on target now. So let's go and uh, start start stalking. So I spotted a rabbit about, about 40 yards away. It's just on the other side of this hedgerow. So
sweet Ned shot. I'm going to go retrieve that rabbit. I'm going to go over to the woods now. We're trying to show you how I go about preparing them for the park. Ooh, I got a bit hot and sweaty stalking then. Super glad with our result. We bagged ourselves a bunny. So I'm going to show you it now and get ready for the park. So guys, there's, uh, there's more than one way of getting a rabbit. There's many ways to skin them. Usually, I'd make an incision roughly here and cut down. Get your fingers inside and pull all the guts out. Or you can make the incision, grab his front legs and flip the guts out yourself. But what I'm going to show you today is quite a controversial method called the squeeze method. And um, well, I don't know which is more brutal, but we're going to squeeze slowly. Basically, we're going to squeeze his guts out of his rear end. You want to really make sure that you're not going to rupture anything inside when doing this. And you do need quite a strong pair of hands. they're bulging and there we go so what should only be left in here now is the lungs the heart and maybe the kidneys but as you can see that rabbit with the entrails down there that rabbit is now cleaned and awaiting the pot what I'm going to do next is make a small incision in its skin here, out the back. Start peeling back the skin itself. Get your thumbs in there. I like to do it so that it's basically just arms, legs and head left. Like so. There we go. And now what I'll do is a kidney there. On our side. I like to just batten these off. So right, that's the meat sorted for the stew. I've quartered the rabbit up. It's quite hard to butcher outside, so I'll show you that later. I put it in some foil in the pan for now. What we're going to do now is we're going to go out and we're going to try and find some wild edibles and hopefully make a stew. I've got some water in my canteen in the bag. We've got a fire pit here that was left by the landowner. I'd like to stress one thing when it comes down to, to shooting, just hunter gathering in general. It's so, so important to make sure that you get permission, whether it's from a friend or a relative it doesn't really matter just as long as you've got permission on the land otherwise you could be potentially facing jail time we've all done it when we were younger that's a different story but now as adults i think it's really key to stress that you get the landowner's permission and just do things the right way you know 
luckily Peter who owns this farm is a good friend of mine and he's kind enough to pretty much let me do what I want on here and I'll be forever grateful for that so anyway let's go foraging and see what we can find so we've come to the first edition of wild edible that we're going to be adding to our stew normally these, these are a pretty good addition to any salad the wild primrose and the They're super floral, the super floral taste to it. But we're gonna just pick only a couple just to garnish our stew. In fact we'll probably just throw in everything all together. But let's take four or five of those and move on. See if we can do a look close up of primrose. Here we go. Our second wild edible. Probably the most obvious and most well used wild edible is the common stinging nettle. But these are super super high in vitamins and just an all around great tasting plant. My hands are quite used to handling nettles and I've heard a lot of people say that if you consistently sting yourself with stinging nettles you're less liable to be suffering from hay fever. Now whether or not there's truth in that I don't know but a lot of the people who state that that works I trust quite well so I tend to pick just the the young top leaves as these seem to be a lot more tender to eat. The thing with a stingy nettle is that once once the the, the sting itself gets exposed to heat it actually kills off the, the ingredient that makes it sting. I think it just burns down the little stingies themselves. I can feel my fingers tingling here but it's not it's not painful anymore. You can also make nettle beer out of these, nettle wine. They just get an all round great plant to utilise. So we're gonna pet a few more of these buds and move on again. So this is our third wild edible. These are known as cleavers, some people might know them as sticky willies. There's all sorts of uh, different names that people are given them. But you'll know these as in the summer and coming into autumn they produce the little sticky balls and they they really are not so much on this coat but they are they really do stick to you. Used to throw them at each other, which are the kids. With these I really like to pick the younger the younger shoots again because the younger plants themselves before they actually seeded are the ones that don't become so bitter and un unpalatable so we're just gonna, we're not gonna take too many of these but I'm gonna put a few in again guys it's really important when picking these just to pick them off the path I know, I know this bit of woodland, nobody comes here, so uh, I know there's not going to be any foul liquids or solids that have gone on these that I know of. These can also be dried and ground down and used as a coffee substitute. Quite nice as well, I've tried them myself, it's not too bad doesn't match the likes of coffee itself but it is quite nice one thing I forgot to mention as I'm walking through here there's many of you I know will be watching this that are experts at foraging I'm actually walking past quite a few things that you could potentially eat but things that are not really to my taste so I'm just going to be ignoring those and really picking what I want to use for this stew. So this is probably one of the most recognisable wild edibles, the dandelion. Pretty sure every one of you out here has come into contact with dandelions. The whole of the dandelion plant is edible. We're going to take two of the flowers and we're going to take a few more of the leaves themselves as I think these will provide quite a staple part of 
the majority of this um, this stew itself. Super high in vitamins and nutrients. Just checking the plant when I'm picking it to make sure there's no bugs, etc. on the plant. Again, I know this area doesn't get walked. There's no dogs, there's no bar wild animals, there's nothing that comes into here. Even when foraging something that you, you really do know well, I just make sure that you double check before you put it into the pot that what you've picked is what you, what you know, that what you wanted to pick in the first place. Because it's, especially now when filming, it's too easy just to quickly look at the camera and pick up something that you don't want to necessarily be eating. So here we have hawthorn, easily identifiable by its leaves and its super spiky branches. You don't want to get a prick off one of those. So we're going to take the young leaves again before these start going in into fruit mode. The young leaves can be quite soft. You can see here that it's already started to go that way. So I'll leave that one. Just really want to take the younger leaves here. The fruit itself are also edible. There's loads of YouTube videos out there on what you can do making uh, fruit, fruit flat bars and all sorts of different recipes with hawthorn. It's definitely worth checking out. So we're going to put a few of those in as well. And moving on. Heaven, all is beds here, bar that the ones with the white flowers, the wild garlic, more commonly known as ramsons. The whole part of the plant is edible again. Super garlicky taste, so I'm going to be taking quite a bit of this. Oh, it's so garlicky, it's so good, it's unreal. I really do like the flowers more than I like the leaves, but they're going to make a staple part of the stew and it's really going to give it some real density and flavour. Just stuff it in there now. It's not as potent as garlic itself but it's really got that thick garlicky taste. I'm not too bothered as long as the leaves aren't like that. Then I'll, I'm pretty easy to but again, if you pick the younger ones, they're going to be more supplement. They're probably better eating them in the long run. Add some more of these flower heads. The one thing I really like about wild garlic, being it's seasonal, is that when it does come out, it's, it's out in force, so you really just can't you couldn't pick it all, you know. I've heard so many people saying foragers come out and they, they pick the lot. Really? And this is just if I just turn the camera. If I can turn the camera, yeah. I mean it's just the whole the whole wood is just covered with it. So I think, I, I think I'm going to call that enough for this stew. So we're going to make our way back over to the woods, get a fire going, and cook ourselves some food. I could spend a whole video on its own taking you around, showing you all different various wild edibles, but let's, let's save that for another video. Sorry about the noise of the helicopter. I think it's Mountain Rescue and we've got to forever be grateful to them. Anyway, we're back in the woods and I'm going to use this old fire grate that the landowners left. Clean up this bit of a fire. 
make ourselves a nice fight to cook on. Bit naughty this is. So this is silver birch guys, it's not native to this country but it's a great commodity in bushcraft to us. As you can see it sheds, it's out the bark and this stuff is full of oils and it's great for catching a spark off a ferro rod and starting a fire with so we're going to strip back some of this and we're going to use that to start a fire. I think I think that'll do us to be honest with you. So this is the birch bark that we just collected and um, we want to just try and rough it up a little bit, try and make a few smaller pieces just to try and catch that first spark off the ferro rod and then we've got some smaller branches and um, hopefully we can get a fire going now. I know we'll get a fire going because I've got <laughs> copious amounts of stuff to make a fire. I like to scrape a bit of stuff straight into the birch bark. There you go. That was really poor technique then, so I apologise for that. This ferro rod is so short that I really struggle to, to get. I'm just going to go ahead and put this grate over it for now. Pretty sure we got more than enough wood underneath there to keep that fire going. And we'll just feed some sticks into it when we need it. Right guys, I want to say a thank you to everybody who's been watching the channel and most of all those people who have subscribed and liked the videos. So here's to you. IPA, proper hoppy ale, 5.5%. It is Friday. So, wherever you are in the world, whoever you are, thanks for watching. Yaki Darth and Wales. Oh, I took the fire grate off because it was just smothering it for now, but we're going to get this fire again, some good embers, and we're going to get food on because I am starving. Right, so in here is our rabbit meat that we shot and prepped earlier. You see the hind legs, front legs, the loin, pretty much everything that we could scrape off the animal. Um, I can tell you now that there was nothing really left on the carcass, bar a bit of, you know, a, a bit of bone. So that'll be going in the pan. But firstly, we're going to have to heat up our frying pan, which we're going to. I'm using a sort of wok, which I think will be ideal for frying the rabbit off, and then using it to make a stew in. So, I bought some butter from the house. Probably the only thing, bar the foil, that um, I haven't forished. Well, and the pan, and the gun, but <laughs> and the fire grate, and the beer, there you are, never mind. Chuck that in there. Get that melted down. It's looking good already, isn't it? So, the butter's melting down nicely, as you can see, and straight in with the rabbit. 
got to be careful here. You want to give it a nice coat then with the butter. And we're going to saute that rabbit for a bit just to seal it up. Fry it then. Get it nice and hot before we add some beer to try and caramelise the rabbit a bit before we put our greens and liquids in. A bit of seasoning and we'll give it some time then while we drink our beer all those flavours to uh, get indulged with each other. We're well, just trying to brown this rabbit off in the butter before we add anything else. So you can see it's starting to change colour already and go into its typical white characteristics when a, when a rabbit's cut. It's just a <laughs> botched up spatula that I made out of a piece of hazel because I didn't have anything else. I don't want to use my, uh, my eating spoon quite yet. This beer's going down the tree. Definitely. The rabbit's really starting to cook now. So the flavour's off this already. The aroma, sorry. The buttered rabbit is just smelling phenomenal. But we've really got to try and brown the meat before we add any of the beer. And then we'll give it a quick caramelisation with the beer and then add our our greens which I've got in my billy cup from earlier and then we'll add some water and a bit of seasoning we'll give it half hour hour and then we're gonna tuck in with younger rabbits you really can get away with pan frying them but the older the rabbit you really want to be sort of um, slowly poaching them for quite a while Otherwise they don't end up being as tender as what you really want them to be. But I'm sure this is this is gonna be phenomenal. The reason I keep putting the spatula back into the flames is just to sterilise it every time that I'm touching the meat. It's just something that I've done for a long, long time and something I don't plan on changing anytime soon. So they're browned off quite nicely. Uh, I think it's time now to add the beer to the to the mixture. Well, hang on now, don't go off there. It's never sack with the cooking with beer. Don't know if you can see that, but it's going to be delicious. Obviously, it's a. Uh, Cool the cooking down a bit, but that'll, that'll soon start bubbling up nicely, and the sugars and the beer start caramelising that chicken, and you get this really nice brown brothy colour and flavouring going into the rabbit, which is just absolutely delicious. So I'm going to add some. St I'm going to add some stock now to the to the pot. This tub is something that stays in my bag, my camping bag, um, throughout throughout the year. Basically, I just top it up as I go. But it consists of it, there's always a there's a Carolina Reaper in there. But we're not going to be using that today. I'm going to go for a run tomorrow, and I don't uh, I don't fancy being pushed forward by an arse of fire. So salt and pepper staple ingredient to any stew inside or outside. We're gonna bang quite a let's, let's, let's go for like two good pinches in there. And don't necessarily do this but let's chuck a stock pot in there as well. Always like to break this up. And then finally in here is just an array of curry powders and garam masala, paprikas. It's a really good, you could add it to anything but it, it's primarily a curry powder, turmeric and all sorts. We're just going to give it a little pinch. 
just for a, just for a bit of flavour as well. Why not? Good luck uh, cleaning that off your hands. So yeah, give it a little bit longer now, and we'll we'll put our greens in. So one of the reasons that I cut the rabbit stew in this way is the beer and the butter along with the caramelization actually gives it a thicker gravy texture you can see it there so when you do add your greens and a little bit of water you're not just going to end up with a runny mess you can have some solid oh my god mm, tastes tastes phenomenal that's what it tastes like it tastes absolutely phenomenal so yeah so you can see here that it's really starting to thicken up now providing a really nice gravy base so we're just going to get our vegetables or our, or our greens again you've got plenty of wild garlic here get a little line there Heads, leaves, the lot. Probably enough there. I probably picked too much of that, to be honest with you. So there's hawthorn leaves from earlier. Some dandelions. Really fresh veg here. Dandelion heads. And a load of nettles. Super, super healthy here by the by the beer guys. So hopefully now these greens, if I can keep them in the pan, which doesn't look too um, promising at the moment, they are all going to come on, Max. Try and keep them in the pan. Now. They're all going to soften down. Oh, the smells! It's something else. It's just something else. Like I said, the stinging nettles, once applied to the heat, lose their stinging abilities. And, last but not least, get some water in there. Not too much, we don't want an overly runny meal. I think, I think that's about right. So we're just gonna let it boil over now for half an hour which is probably not quite long enough but um, the, longer you, the longer you leave it the better guys but I, I am out I've, I've also got to get home tonight and walk the dog and go to the pub for a couple of beers saying it is Friday so I know this rabbit is cooked but pan fried it hard enough it was a young rabbit it's cooked throughout but I'm just going to give it that extra time now to marinate in these juices with that gravy base and then I'm going to tuck in so what looks like an absolutely delicious dish. So I'm on my second bottle. Enjoy. Right guys, I've given this 30 minutes, 45, pushing an hour probably, but uh, I'm going to go straight in with a nice tender bit of rabbit and the greens. Oh. Oh. It's absolutely phenomenal. My camera's going to run out of battery. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for everybody who subscribed and liked the videos. If you could do me a massive favour, if you haven't, just like the video, press the thumbs up, maybe leave a comment. Subscribe if you want to watch more videos, it's totally free, just press the button, subscribe, and you'll get notified when a new video comes up. I'm not going to disgust you, 
with me eating this <laughs> this uh, stew. But here from Maxim Outdoors, thank you so much for watching. I'm going to enjoy this beer, eat my food. I'm going to sign out. Much love, stay safe, see you all soon. Oh.